The following is an excerpt from Henry Hank Silvert's memoir, An Indelible Event and Detour Through a Global Childhood. It's a dramatic reading about an event that occurred at Hanover, New Hampshire High School, where Hank attended in the 1960s. It begins with a letter that Hank's father wrote to the principal of the high school. And it ends with Hank's summary of the episode. Yesterday, September 27th, my son Henry was forcefully ejected by Mr. James W. Garrity from his science class, as you know. The nubbin of the matter seems clear enough. Mr. Garrity asked my son to be quiet or leave the class. My son said no for whatever may have been his motives at the moment. Henry, shut up! No, why should I be the only one to shut up if everybody else is also talking? Ugh, get out of here, you dirty Jew bastard! No! Mr. Garrity then grabs my son by his shirt collar with both hands and proceeds to drag him across the floor with his desk in tow and throws him out of the room. <sighs> my reasons for calling, Mr. Garrity, were to see how closely to the actual events my son's description of the situation resembled the actual incident, so that I could take appropriate home action. To discover Mr. Garrity's reaction, so my son could be prepared for a return to his class, if that was permissible, and to learn whether it was advisable that I see you or Mr. Stimson on the matter. Mr. Garrity told me forcefully on the telephone that my son should have recognized how upset he was. He emphasized that he had told Henry twice to be quiet and was openly defied, and that he, Mr. Garrity, had to maintain discipline in the classroom even if physical violence was called for. Toward the end of the discussion, I suggested that, in a selfish sense, the most important thing was for my son to receive a decent education within an environment conducive to his development. Therefore, I asked Mr. Garrity about Henry's re-entry to the class and the future relations between the two. Mr. Garrity answered, in very gentlemanly fashion, that Henry was welcome to return the following day and that Mr. Garrity had never held any grudges against any student. I have no reason to doubt this statement, and I am confident that it was made in full and generous sincerity. Mr. Garrity also invited me to discuss the matter with you, if I so desired. I told him on the telephone that I had no wish to cause undue disturbances, if matters could be settled among the three of us. But because in retrospect, several aspects of the telephone conversation have left me deeply disturbed, I feel it necessary, at least, to let my voice be heard in a formal sense. Because of Hanover's small town atmosphere, Hanky wasn't immediately welcomed by some of his teachers and classmates. At first, I thought it was primarily due to his limited physical abilities, or his difficulty communicating clearly in English. I thought, and hoped, their reactions would change once they got to know him better. It turned out I was highly mistaken. While I think these factors certainly affected people's perception of him, I learned shortly after school started, there was a much simpler and sinister explanation for his cool reception. People's reactions were based largely on our own last name and a stereotypical understanding of our religious background. Not that it should have mattered, but we were non-observant except for a few holidays, like Hanukkah and Passover, and we celebrated these in a non-traditional manner. The religious hostility fired up the very first week of classes when he did well on an end-of-year paper, and the boy sitting behind him taps him on the shoulder. Killer of Christ, where are your horns? Did you wrap them up under your clothes? I never met him, so why would I have killed him? After Hanky recounted this episode to me and my wife that evening, my wife explained the unfortunate stereotypes of Jews that some people held. She also pointed out that while our family didn't think of Judaism exclusively as a religion, most non-Jews couldn't understand it as anything but a religion. And even then, it should not predispose them to baseless hatred. 
She suggested Hanke refrain from engaging in conversations about Judaism until he learned more about it. The next day, Henry goes to school with his pockets stuffed with small pebbles. If you say anything nasty to me again, I will throw stones at you. Ha! Killer of Christ! Where are your horns? Did you wrap them up under your clothes? And my son reached into his pockets, and one by one, he started throwing the pebbles at the boy. Let's meet at the gasoline station down the block after school and settle this once and for all with our fists. Henry arrives at the gas station to find the boy and a crowd. The boy knocks Henry down to the ground, sits on top of his stomach, and declares himself the winner. I won! Give up, Henry! I won! No! Come on, Henry, you lost! Uh, no, I didn't! No, I didn't! No, I didn't! During his time at Hanover High School, Hanke learned that stereotypes, such as those held by his classmate and teachers, were not always so blatantly stated, and were often not directed at him personally. Teachers would often ask questions with hidden meanings instead of saying what they meant. An example of teachers raising important issues, but never following through with a full-blown discussion of the topics, occurred in Hanke's seventh grade, quarter-long humanities class. The principal of the high school, Mr. Petrick, taught the class during a discussion about Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement. Okay, class. Raise your hands if they wouldn't mind if a Negro family moved onto the block that they lived on. Hmm, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, keep your hand raised if you wouldn't mind if there were two Negro families on your block. One, two, three, four. How many of you would not mind being the only white family living on the block? One, two, three. Uh, I just wanted to know. My primary purpose in writing the letter is to see that some justice be done my son, lest he simply be written off as a nuisance to protect an action which obviously was partially the mistake of the teacher. I think the most pathetic part of it all is that my son gave Mr. Garrity a better shake in telling the story than Mr. Garrity gave him. At least Henry said his teacher was upset, while Mr. Garrity excused himself in part by saying the student should have acted on that knowledge. Why should the teacher expect the student to have the psychological insight which he himself does not have? Maybe Hanky was upset too, as Mr. Garrity suggested. If they were both upset, why should the teacher come off the episode excused? My son marked down as, at best, an impolite bore. Why should Mr. Garrity not have offered me one direct word of apology? Why was I forced to explain some of my son's difficulties without any reciprocal action from Mr. Garrity in the form of a clear apology for his obvious mistakes? Why should he hesitate to state he dragged Henry on the floor? The roots of the matter, then, are several. An act of violence was committed by a teacher in a schoolroom. A telephone call by a parent to the teacher contained many elements of genuine goodwill on the part of the teacher, and other of vast defensiveness. The likely outcome, if I say nothing, is that all will be forgotten except that my son is a juvenile delinquent in the making. A decent human being had been publicly humiliated and his dignity stripped from him before his fellows without a word of contrition from his teacher. Henry has been having his best year in school since the age of six. He was happy, working well, and more alert and brighter than we have seen him in years. To tag him as a behavior problem in a situation which obviously was not all his fault is to damage the course of his education as well as his recuperation and is to perpetrate an obvious injustice. I have been a teacher myself too long not to know that sometimes students are served up to the harmon of the system. It happens from kindergarten to the PhD level, and in the latter case such occurrences are notorious. It is not the first time in your school that Henry has been made to seem a behavior problem because of his reaction to the provocations of others. Last year, after bearing taunts of fat, cockeyed, stupid, 
and other such kind remarks from a classmate. He himself reacted noisily and aggressively, and was promptly marked down as a problem child. He is, of course, something of a problem child, although decreasingly so, but so are those who are the provokers, as well as those adults who lose their self-control. Lashing out so at a student with whom there previously had been no difficulties in that class, and who has, to the best of my knowledge, so far presented no problems in this still young semester. My father mailed the letter the following morning. I'm not aware of any further contact between my father and the school administration. The afternoon following Mr. Garrity's tirade, the principal secretary intercepted me and asked me to come to Mr. Petrick's office. Once I was seated opposite the principal, the humanities teacher who had so recently asked our thoughts on living next to an African American, exclaimed, you know, I would rather live next to a Jew than a Negro. Except, he used a much more objectionable and derogatory word for an African American. There it was, racism on a platter. Mr. Garrity's words the day before and Mr. Petrick's statement were flagrant examples of racism on a platter. Now I understood the purpose of his question in the humanities class. He wanted to give the class a visual image of those who had differing views on this issue, in the hope that it would sow division among the students and perhaps influence their thinking. I was amazed, angry, hurt, and astonished by how people could be so cruel. I had never been treated this badly in any school I had ever attended before. Not in New Orleans, not in Chile, and not in Argentina, but here in Hanover, New Hampshire, where my parents had come to escape the stench of growing racial tension in New Orleans, we had landed in the middle of it. Happily, Many of my classmates started to show signs of resistance to these abhorrent statements and overt forms of prejudice. Another offender, though, was Mr. Wilson, our eighth grade geography teacher, who was also one of the town's part-time policemen, and who exhibited a distinct propensity towards racial prejudice and discrimination, although I'm sure he would have vehemently denied them. One day, during our lessons on African geography, Mr. Wilson asked the class, where did the Negro race come from? There was an audible silence in the classroom. Nobody said a word, and yet everyone knew that he was about to make an insane remark. They came from the Niger River, he said. However, he pronounced the name of the river as if it had two G's instead of one. There was absolute silence after he said this, which indicated to me that my classmates were beginning to understand and reject the implied meanings of what some of the teachers were saying. 